Hello everybody, it's Robert Dunn from arttop10.com and I'm very pleased to be here today having a virtual studio tour and chat with Paula MacArthur. Hello, Paula. Hello. Hi, Rob. Uh, nice to meet you. <laughs> How are you? So, um, well, it was Graham Crowley, who used to be the head of painting at the Royal College of Art, who told me to get in touch with you. And so, um, tell me a bit about yourself. You're, you're a painter. Um, what sort of things do you paint? What, what drives you on? Um, well, thanks to Graham for the introduction, first of all. He's been a great support over the last few years. Um, um, so, my painting since... Um, I was thinking about it this morning, actually. Um, I had a career break when I had the children, oh. um, which is quite a, quite a while ago now. Um, <laughs> And uh, I used to be a portrait painter, and most of my work was uh, self-portraiture. But when I've kind of... Um, sorry? Self-portrait. Self yeah. Yes, yes. Um, very realistic. I was a real purist, always worked from observation, wouldn't dream of using photographs. Mm. Uh, and then over the years, uh, photography came in, and it kind of uh, became perhaps a bit more contemporary um but yeah after a break well, well, a well, kid, well were, there, were you doing different kind of self-portraits was it always you as you are or were you sort of in fancy dress or uh, in, <laughs> was there a in the early days in the early days it wasn't quite fancy dress but i was definitely playing a role i oh. think i was kind of exploring different aspects of my personality if you like yeah, yeah. um and yeah mostly this was um as a student um uh, i studied at loughborough college of art and design and then went straight to the royal academy um and uh yeah i think i managed to get um about eight years at art college altogether <laughs> which was fantastic yeah, um and really fun I mean, you can imagine that now, um, but what a fantastic opportunity. And to really? be honest, if, if, uh, if that hadn't been funded, I probably wouldn't be a painter now. I'd be doing something quite different. Um, I wouldn't have gone to art college um, if I'd had to pay to do it. Anyway, yeah. that's a whole uh, <laughs> yeah. another story. Uh, but, uh, um, yeah, yeah, so, so I was... This this break come from the self portraits to to well yeah what 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 so now the when i went uh a friend was struggling to pay her studio rent hi rachel and <laughs> um, and uh, i said well i you know maybe i could help you out there if you don't mind sharing so uh that was sort of what kick-started me into working again is of you know having a few couple of young toddlers um i kind of didn't really think too much about what i was going to paint so i just kind of picked up a photograph that i'd liked and um started working from that and it kind of went from there and it was probably at least a year after i'd sort of started working on these images um, I realised it was essentially still life painting now. Okay. Um, so I do memento mori, really. Um, often I'm working with objects that I found in museums or sometimes so, churches so, so, that often... So just for those other... How would you explain a memento mori, just, just to people out there who wanted to know what it's, that was? Um, it's memento mori... It is often, if you think of Dutch still life painters, um, often um, very kind of opulent, luxurious objects painted, often with kind of insects or snails and things creeping. Um, sometimes you'll have a, a, an obvious reference like a skull in the Vanitas paintings. Um, which refer to death 
and uh, often there's things like a glass of water which will refer to life so it's it's the big questions in in an essentially kind of domestic setting I suppose um, so my kind of interpretation of that if you like is finding these um, valuable objects often that I think uh, things that I often find in museums um, I don't get because you kind of get this kind of gut feeling about uh, a, an object that you want to work with and it's um, it's uh, often quite a kind of a physical thing you know you get a kind of feeling in your stomach or you gasp or you know if you're with someone you go wow look at that <laughs> It's something that really excites me. Um, so uh, I've worked a lot with gemstones. I'm starting a new series on crystals, which relates back to those, but um, it's got more more kind of natural forms rather than kind of uh, man-made syn synthetic looking. Sure, um, sure. And I've also worked a lot with Rococo ornaments as well. Um, and you know they're all valuable objects but i hope that the part of my kind of um meditation on those objects is about what is valuable to me and whilst these are beautiful and i find them exciting objects yeah. um it's something else um that is much more valuable than anything material so they're, That's so a very they're being so, so in the painting, they're being transformed, what, into your memory or your emotional response? I think that's what I'm trying to, to, to get at, really, is my emotional response when I've first experienced those objects. Um, and I think if I pick it apart a little bit further, um, a lot of these um, objects might be reminders of um, uh, particularly the objects I found in churches yeah. a reminder of, you know when I was much younger and kind of uh, old experiences for me in church and uh, oh. the kind of um, the, the the power that 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 has you know those kind of spaces yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, have um, and I find myself so, so it's almost it's almost a way into your deeper emotional relationships with these places. The the object sort of gives you a a way in, as it were. Yes, I think so. Um, it, it's um, and I find myself within an object. Um, maybe not so much the the gemstones. Um, but with the crystals and I've done some things with drapery um, and with the Rococo objects, I find myself kind of selecting an object, but then kind of selecting a section and then going in even further. So it's sort of zooming in and in and in, oh. in a way to kind of find the essential important bit for me. Um, the bit that, really speaks to me I suppose um, working in really quite an instinctive way um, so, 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 that, so, so when you start the painting in a way does, does you take one shot of the object as it were does, does that then change completely as you go along might you move from well, when I find an object, I don't just take one photograph. I, I might end up with 50 or 100. You know, I get quite, <laughs> I'm quite obsessive because they're not things I have to hand and I, it's not always easy for me to refer back to them. I want to um, get as much information as I can. Um, and... Um, yeah, I use. Yeah, I suppose I, sometimes I would take a lot of close-ups and then get back to the studio and think, "Oh, I wish I could see the whole thing," or "I wish I could see it from that side or the back." Or so I will now take as many photos as I can, 
even if I don't think they're useful, I will have them there kind of in the bank to refer to. Um, and then as I'm painting, well, I suppose, first of all, I will edit these photographs. Um, so I'll in, um, like a, a, a while back, I painted um, an aquamarine gemstone, which is in the Natural History Museum in London. Uh, it's huge. It's, it's about that size. Yeah. Uh, but the, my painting is reds and crimsons and magentas, so it's become a kind of a, a ruby, really. But in my kind of fairly amateurish dabbling in Photoshop, <laughs> sometimes there are happy accidents. Uh, and you get, again, this, you know, when something turquoise becomes crimson, you get that kind of wow moment again. And, and it kind of... Um, you know the excitement starts all over get all over again. Um, yeah, so I, I'll sort of do that first of all, and then when I've got my photograph, I will start in a fairly traditional way, making a grid on the image, a very a large grid. It's not very detailed, um, and I usually divide the canvas and the photo up into thirds and quarters. Okay. Um, and I sort of, you know, uh, quite like the, um, you know, I do like geometry and the mathematics of all of these objects. That's something they all have in, in common. Um, so that, you know, pushing them into thirds and quarters and stretching things a little bit to fit that simple grid is just a little game I play with myself. Uh, probably nobody else would be able to detect, detect that that's there. Yeah, that, that, that's quite interesting, actually. I, I, I'm sure you know uh, William Coldstream, that kind of classic yeah. British painter who looks like he's always painting to try and get the most accurate representation of the figure or the object. But he said exactly the same, yeah. that he enjoyed playing mathematical games. And he would actually... He would actually so, so it's not actually always as accurate as you might think. He's actually changed the shape to get these proportions he was enjoying playing with. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's um, I mean, I did look at Coldstream quite a lot as a student. I, d I looked at it, I didn't read about it very much. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, painters like Sargent as well, who would elongate their figures enormously just for the same kind of reasons. Um, but yes, I enjoy playing all those games, and it's just one of those, it's, a, it's also a way of starting. You know, there's nothing more difficult than uh, being faced with a blank white canvas. Um, so it's just, you know, making those marks on the canvas, um, you kind of destroyed that pristine surface, so then it's okay to start. And, you know, I think a lot of painters would say the same thing, that you have to kind of trick yourself in, into working. Um, in many ways it, it's uh yeah it's yeah, a no, high yeah, pressure yeah. situation you, yeah you, you've got to try and get yourself going as it were haven't you yeah yeah, yeah. And, and then once uh, i'm there, once i've got the you know i will start with the you know what i see is the basic gestures of the object um and then it kind of builds from there really i i and again i suppose i'm editing it Again, you know, I put down what seems most important, first of all, um, the crucial parts of the painting. Um, and, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, then, uh, and then, and then, and then, then so, yeah. so how, long, how long, do, do they all take a similar amount of time or some happen quite quickly or some quite slow to sort of get to that? I guess you're searching for, you're not really searching, you're searching for them to create a feeling in you, really, are you? Um, goodness knows what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm, I suppose I have some sort of, when I start, I do have a kind of, because I'm working from a photograph, I have an idea of what it will look like in the end mm. but often 
um, uh, often it's is it's not entirely dissimilar, but it is different. It's, it can be quite dramatic. Sometimes you'll come into the studio and go, think, what shall I do today? And, you know, on more than one occasion, I've, I've said, well, actually, maybe that's finished. Uh, ah, okay. You know, it's, quite, it's quite surprising that you leave something thinking, okay I'll come back tomorrow and I'll do xyz and in the morning something as magical has happened overnight and uh it it's 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 ready it's done oh, that's, that's, um, weird. that's quite weird actually isn't it that's that's what Picasso said Picasso said didn't he never finish a painting and then I remember some other guy uh who taught me painting saying he kind of meant if you leave it alone the painting it just sort of finishes itself which well, yeah, there is that weird, I mean, yes, painters, paintings do um, kind of lead you in certain directions that you feel that you're following some something else, you know, it doesn't, uh, and I think maybe authors would say the same thing about the characters in their yeah, yeah. book, you know, they would write the story, so it, perhaps it's a similar, a similar idea, but the, the, yeah, the, the paint does tell you what to do. And I suppose particularly when I, you know, I'm working with very thin um, glazes often and it drips down the canvas. Um, and I, you know, I love the sort of sensuality of that. And um, uh, and it also gives the, the image a quality of kind of fading away and deteriorating. Um, uh, and impermanence, I suppose, which relates back to the memento mori idea. Um, so, so but I, the pain so, often leads to somewhere that you didn't expect. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I like the sense of the dripping and the glazes. Actually, talking about that, is it, is it possible to see any of them in the in your studio? Is it? Are you, uh, well, are you attached to your desktop? I so I haven't got. Um, I've actually, I put one on the wall this morning just to photograph it. Let me see. Have I gone upside down or something? No, no, no you're good. I'll see if, uh, <laughs> right, let me see if I can flip this around and I'll show you. Uh, there we go. Oh, nice. Can cool. you see oh, that? Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, so really this is, that's a painting and it's, you know, oddly for me, it's quite small. That's 40 centimetres square. Okay. Um, but um, yes, and actually quite quickly I painted that. Um, I was on a residency at the Griffin Gallery in West London, um, working with the uh, paint chemists at Win Windsor and Newton. Okay. And um, they were hugely helpful. <laughs> I, was trying to, I was finding that with these paintings, um, you can, if I show you close up, you can yeah, see yeah, that the white, the white highlights yeah. are wiped away. I rarely use white paint. Okay. Um, and I was finding that as the paint dried, I couldn't do that for as long as I wanted to. Okay. So I worked with the, um, the paint chemists and I had an, I'd read, um, that, uh, de Kooning, Willem de Kooning had um, used a mixture of oil paint and water surprisingly oh, with, uh, with safflower oil which okay. dries very slowly yeah. and the magic ingredient that helped it all to um, combine is yeah. um, uh, kerosene. Kerosene? How bizarre. Did yes. kerosene ever dry? Or? Yes, it does. It, it's, it, it's, although kerosene is an oil, um, yeah. and I had easy access to kerosene because our heating at home runs <laughs> off kerosene. Uh, was up. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, yes, I ca carefully lowered a, a jam jar <laughs> into the oil tank to fish some out for huh. my first experiments. Um, so, so yeah, you get the de Kooning described the mixture as blubbery, which okay. is the perfect word for it. And you do find that you get little drops of 
droplets of water in it, but it's a real kind of fatty, odd sort of mixture that is a bit similar to if you've ever tried to make a cake yeah, and yeah. the and the eggs have curdled the mixture. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit like that, and it's kind of interesting to work with but the yeah. beauty of it is that it dries very very slowly so I'd, ha I'd, I'd done a few experiments with that and when I got to Windsor and Newton the chemist there said don't put water in it whatever you do oh, really? um, because it obviously will never dry it becomes trapped within uh. the paint um, and then contracts and expands over time and causes cracking and goodness knows what else. Um, so I decided to try that same recipe, but without the water. And much to my delight, it worked. Uh, and I think this was probably the first painting that I did this with, but it worked beautifully. Yeah. Um, and the paint take, took about seven days to dry. But during that seven days, it was as wet as if I just painted it. Oh, really? And then suddenly, overnight, it was, it was dry. That's um, so the, and the chemist has said it's something to do, probably. I'm not, I can't remember this very well, and I should. Mm. But it's, it's something to do with the chain reaction. So once the chain oh. reaction starts of oxidization or something like that, once the molecules start or the polymers start breaking apart, yeah. uh, it happens very rapidly. Oh. And so, so it goes from being completely wet to suddenly quite dry. And uh, yeah. yeah, so it works a dream. The only downside is obviously that it's highly flammable <laughs> uh, and it really smells. So I I'm don't happy. often add um, kerosene to my, pa to, yeah, to the paint anymore. Yeah. Although during the summer, it's something quite nice to play with outside. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But um, but I do use safflower oil in the paint, which really helps with the slowing down of the drying process. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, so that's one from yeah. 2018. Nice. No. And I've started right. another little one the other day. Um, yeah. So th this is um, in progress. Okay. As you can tell, yeah. um, uh, just based on. Um, I think like a lot of people at the moment in lockdown, I've been going through a lot of old photographs and I okay. came across a beautiful one and uh, just thought, oh, I'll do that right now. Um, so, yes, this is some kind of quartz, I think. Oh, it is a crystal. It is a um, but I can, you know, I'm using the, the paint sort of as thinly as uh, watercolour, really. Oh, I did um, I did think some of the things you've got, they do look quite watercolory, although I'm, I'm yeah. pretty sure they're royals. But it's yeah, no, they, it's always oil paint. Um, occasionally work with um, watercolours, but um, I uh, oil paint is my most familiar sure. medium. Uh, I just, you know, I just, the colours are beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I, I kind of, uh, you know, I've got enough experience with them to kind of, know what they're going to do hmm. um but uh yeah but i, so, I like i, I like i like the way you start them, them quite like <laughs> oh that's a nice picture of all your stuff which which paint yeah, so do, you use? do you use any i mainly use um uh michael harding paints mm, but i have to say that. since doing the um residency with um windsor and newton um mm. and that they gave me an enormous <laughs> amount of pain, which was fantastic. Absolutely, nice. Um, in, including that beautiful Rose Madder, which is um, oh, yeah, so cool. expensive, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, it's become, since then, a rather expensive habit, I'm afraid. <laughs> but uh, the um, uh, Rose Madder varies hugely um, between brands. So I, I went, I thought yeah. after, you know, when I had to restock um i i looked at michael harding's rose madder and it's quite different interesting so um now i've sort of 
I look more carefully, actually. Um, yeah. And I also enjoy using these um, fluorescent colours at the moment. Oh, they look um, quite... Are they oil? So I... No, well, these are pigments, so that's just okay. powder. Um, but I use it to uh, show you there's a tiny little bit of fluorescent pink. Oh, yeah. Cool. Um, what do you mix? Uh, but I just mix it with a little bit of um, terps and safflower oil and okay. literally use it like powder paint. Okay. I know t traditionally um painters would use a, a glass muller and grind it for hours on end to make yeah, yeah, their yeah. oil paints but i've um i'm reliably informed by the internet <laughs> <laughs> i hope um yeah. that when if you're going to use the paint straight away it is okay to to do this just to literally mix it with a brush yeah. on the palette and apply it straight to the painting Oh. So, fingers crossed. I haven't had any um, disasters with it yet. Um, oh, that's quite I'm, use it, I'm using it in... Fun. Yeah, the idea of using the actual pigments is quite fun, but yeah, the idea of having to sit there with sort of 15 pieces of glass scraping them together for four days isn't very attractive, but... Um. Yeah, yeah, there was... When I was a student at Loughborough, one of the other painters did do that and made some beautiful um, paints. Okay. Um, but yes, yeah, so labour intensive. Yeah, yeah, that was a shout out with Paul Shepherd there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think a lot of um, a lot of painters um, in uh, you know with a particular interest in materials are still doing that. Yeah. Um, but it's nice to see that you know people like Michael Harding are making oil paints in the kind of with the traditional methods as well. It's, uh, interesting. it's interesting actually you're saying that the oil paint's having different colours because I remember seeing a photograph I've always been obsessed by Patrick Heron who did those big colourful pictures but there was a yeah. photograph of him and he painted just cadmium red by Windsor and Newton I don't think Michael Harden existed then did they but it was Windsor and Newton no. Robinsons yeah. or somebody it was Sennelier but he just put all the different cadmium reds by the different makers and they're all slightly different yeah. Yeah. Well, did you see the? Uh, oh, it was Bryce Marden, wasn't it? The the Terra Vert exhibition. Okay. Um, no, no. At, was that last summer or? or I've kind of. I really am losing track of time at the moment. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, large paintings, each one done with a different brand of Terra Vert, oh, and uh, the the. The variety of colour was extraordinary. <laughs> Interesting exhibition. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah yes. nice. Uh, so anything love... else that, any other pics in the studio you can show? Well, me? I've got this one, which oh, I've cool. recently um, finished. And this is where I got my... Um, it probably doesn't even really look like a fluorescent colour, but that sort okay. of subtle kind of peachy colour came from a mixture of fluorescent orange and pink. Oh, nice. Um, and <laughs> they're just in little kind of details like here and here, just use it to kind of yeah. enrich the, the colour a little bit. But um, I think as well as the colour, you know, what appeals to me about these objects is often the light. Um, yeah. In fact, going back to um, Graham Crowley, he did write a wonderful essay um, about my work called Still Light. Oh, nice. um, and, um, yeah, that, that was, um, yeah, a privilege for him to write about my work. Um, it's interesting, and, uh, you've, got, you've got a lot of structure in that crystal. It feels like yeah. little kind of mountains with shadows on them. And, well, it feels yeah, it's, very it's, 3D. They become um, almost like landscapes in a way, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah, it is. Actually. This, yeah, one, uh, this <laughs> particular image appealed to me because it was, uh, it looked like it could almost be an explosion or a splash yeah. or something as well. You know, there's this, whilst it's very static and sort of Absolutely, something yeah. that's sort of grown over a long period of time, um, it also <laughs> looks very dynamic. It does. Um, no, it's really yeah. 
yeah thank really you cool. <laughs> so that that's the and i'm work this there's, there's another one there that's turned to the wall okay. which is early days on that one so i'm not <laughs> showing it okay. yet okay. um and then i've also i've been playing around with um yeah this is just kind of playing okay. around with different colors really okay um so i you know so is that an is that an object to start with or is that literally just that was it's i can't remember the name of the stone but it's a okay. bit like um malachite it's like a black like sort that. of yeah. malachite if you know what i mean and it looks <laughs> like it's it's extraordinary stuff uh, yeah. and again it looks like it's bubbling but of course it's completely solid and hard yeah um so it's got that same sort of dynamic quality to it and I suppose all of these things look quite alien in a way, or they could yeah, be, you know, uh, a far-flung galaxy or something. Oh, yeah, that's a bit, a bit um, a bit of a, and I quite like the sort it. of uh, sci-fi um, yeah. aspect of these. Um, so, yeah, we'll see what happens. So, you know, this one I've worked on um, yeah. on an easel here um this one i worked uh flat on a table so i often sort of move between the two so that you can you know when you work flat you can sort of really play around with the kind of uh pooling of paint yeah, and exactly. uh, mixing and yeah That's quite so interesting. you actually move between them being flat and being on the wall to try and juggle away with that kind of accidental Yes, yes I think so. What I I try to um, I I think they could easily become a little bit mannered when you're kind of forcing the kind of drip drips and things. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes if something's really dripping quite a lot, I'll well when um, when I'm in my normal studio, I'll yeah. go downstairs to the kitchen and and um, have a coffee or something and let it do its own thing and um like we were saying early earlier you know when you come back it is actually different it yeah. has has actually painted yeah. itself yeah. um so that kind of um you know it gives you something to respond to you decide yeah. what you want to keep and what you want to leave behind you know what you want to get rid of over paint or wipe off or yeah. Yeah. um but uh yeah, so it's all another, you know, another little thing to sort of trick yourself into not doing yeah. too much to the painting, really, I think. Yeah, let the paint be the decider of what takes place, if you can. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, let it, it, you know, it gives you something interesting to respond to. Um, sometimes it's a total disaster. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, I remember, in fact, when I was how long ago was this it could have been 2009 maybe even longer ago i painted um in fact it's in the other room i could take you into the living yeah, yeah, room it. since i'm home yeah go for it um, so let's hope the kitchen is <coughs> fairly tidy um <laughs> So, oh wow! Oh, Paula, I think you're going to come back in a moment. But um, from break after having the kids, okay. I painted it really um, deep red, as you can yeah. see there. Yeah, oh, that's cool. yeah, um, right. Had to rush off to go from school and then when i came back the next day i was met with a big pile on the floor and then this gorgeous pink stain was left behind oh, right. so um yeah so that was kind of one of the the starting points which was a bit of an accident really um for these uh kind of dripping paintings it's actually really good. So what medium are you using on those? Oh, Paula, am I leaving? I think that was, I think this was just oil, maybe linseed oil at that stage. Okay, okay. Um, and terps. Okay. So, 
Yes. Yeah, it's got it's um, a little yeah, so um, quite intriguing, isn't it? It's a lovely colour pink. It's a really good one. Yeah. Yeah, that was um, a sax colour, I think, that I bought from Fitzpatrick's. It's a gorgeous okay. colour. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's cadmium red deep. But uh, All right. anyway, there you have it. There you have it. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. So, it's so, the rest so. of our living room. <laughs> 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 right, we should probably try and round it up a bit now, even though I'm enjoying everything. Um, <laughs> so we, you, you were just going to tell us a little bit, maybe you want to re return to your, your face. You were just going to tell us a little bit about yes. contemporary well, British yeah. painting, I think. So, yeah, at the... Right, here I am, I think. <laughs> uh, so... What have I done here? Oh, yeah, I think you're, I yeah, think you I'm haven't not flipped quite. it. You haven't flipped it back around to you. Here we go. That's it. Nice. Is that okay? Perfect. Yeah. Might yeah. be a bit wonky. No. Um, so, yeah, um, I w uh, back in February, uh, well, maybe a couple of years ago, I was asked to sort of take on the role of chair of contemporary British painting. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was slightly reluctantly <sighs> said yes. I knew it would be um, a big task. Yeah. Um, um, so it's I took tough. it on. Um, and then in February, this February, um, we became, uh, officially became a constitution. So okay. I was officially voted in as chair. Um, <laughs> in February by all the members. So thanks guys. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, so I feel like I'm kind of legit now. Uh, so tell, tell us, um, what, what, what is contemporary British painting? For, uh, it's a group, it was set up in 2013 by two painters. Uh, Robert Priseman, I think, uh, led everything. It was his idea. Okay. Um, and, uh, Simon Carter, uh, another painter, um, and they both live in Essex, I think. Um, I think they were both kind of feeling a bit kind of um, jaded about the place of painting with, within the art world, um, and they strongly felt that um, it was... Uh, in need of a boost, really. Yeah, they were yeah, both yeah, yeah. very yeah. passionate about painting and and wanted to um, kind of promote it as much as they could. And and I think probably things like Terps, um, Terps Banana also started around the same time. Okay. okay. Um, and there were various other groups like Undead that's popping up. Okay. Um, and so this, yeah, there was kind of maybe something in the water around that time <laughs> relating to painting. Um, I do have to say, I remember as a student in particular, being a painter was a bit kind of uncool, really, yeah, or yeah. really yeah. embarrassing. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway, that seems to have changed completely, thanks yeah, to yeah. people like Robert and Simon <laughs> and Marcus, who set up Terps. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's painting seems now to be going from strength to strength. Absolutely. Um, just looking around degree shows, you can see that it's um, uh, there's a lot of exciting things happening in painting. Exactly. Um, yeah. So we are essentially we're an artist-led group. There's 70 of us now. We've just uh, oh. elected new members, um, and I think uh, Robert's initial idea of the the now number of members which is rather nice is that it relates to the population of the British Isles oh, right. so I think we're close to 70 million <laughs> <laughs> so it's just a kind of a little joke really but uh, that we're one in a million but of course you know, we it's uh, calling ourselves contemporary British painting of course we're not you know, when the 70 of us are not the only yeah, no, contemporary no, no. British painters around. Um, so we do, we promote exhibitions 
as much as possible through our social media, which is at Paint Britain. Yeah. Um, and is that and on Twitter and Instagram? We're, at Paint we're Britain. on Twitter, Instagram, and on Facebook, we are Contemporary British Painting. Okay. So Lucy Cox um, looks after the Facebook page. Okay. Uh, and Nabi Price and myself look after the Instagram okay. and Twitter um, at the moment, and it changes sure. um, uh, every so often because it's a daily. You know, we do this it's every day, day of the year, um, and uh, mm. so uh, we have. You know, painting of the day is one of the most important things that we do. So anyone in the world. It doesn't matter who you are or what you do. You can um, email us images yeah. and we'll select from those and post one every day at 11 o'clock. That's you choosing. Um, it must be a nightmare choosing, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I did it for uh, maybe a year or so and it is, uh, it's, it's a difficult job. Um, yeah, how many do you get every day? He's looking after that at the moment. Yeah. Um, and uh, as well as that, we do the Contemporary British Painting Prize, which, again, um, anyone who's working in the British Isles can enter. Um, we try and keep the, the um, entry fee as low as we can. Um, most of us uh, are working on that voluntarily. And we've... Um, Four years that's been going now. Um, we've had four very worthy winners who are all now members. Um, Kathy Lomax, Narby Price, he was uh, the second winner. Joe Packer in 2018 and Joanna Whittle last year. Very nice. So, yeah, and we're working towards the next one at the moment. So nice. watch this space. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, it sounds it sounds absolutely fantastic. So um I've really enjoyed chatting. Thank you so much for telling us all about those things. I'll put at the bottom of the, the YouTube channel, I'll put the information. So I'll put the information of your website, Contemporary British Painting, at Paint Britain, those sort of things. So people can all track them down. Um, Brilliant. Thanks, Robert. Yeah. No, but it'd be cool. Well, really nice to chat. No, it was lovely to chat. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, I've enjoyed my kind of <laughs> wandering around. <laughs> new studio yeah. uh, <laughs> no it's good um, it's really and yeah good. maybe once all this lockdown's over we might meet in person we'll have a proper uh, meet up in the studio for real but yeah we do it's part <laughs> two <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah that'd be great yeah <laughs> thanks very okay. much okay sure Cheers. bye, bye. bye. bye.